Uh, I believe the message that is before us is what God wants us to share, uh, to share together this morning. And the title of the message is Faithfulness, the Bedrock of Love. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful and thankful unto you because you made it possible for us to be in your house today. Father God, you have a message for your people. Father, may you speak at this hour. But Father, as you are speaking through me to your people, do not forget me, Father. May you change my heart <coughs> before other people's hearts can be changed. May your Holy Spirit be at the tip of my tongue. That, Father, you increase and let I decrease. For this is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, as I've said, we are looking at faithfulness. The bedrock of love. I want to ask you a question, something that may be obvious. What does it mean to be faithful? I know you're probably thinking, come on, Dada. Is that a question you should be asking us? We all know what it means to be faithful. That's simple and straightforward. I want to read to you a story. I'll read it in the voice of the narrator. I was 20 and he was 26. We had been married for two years and I hadn't dreamt he would be unfaithful. The awful truth was brought home to me when a young widow from a neighboring farm came to tell me she was carrying my husband's child. My world collapsed. I wanted to die. I felt the urge to kill her and him. But I knew that wasn't the answer. I prayed for strength and guidance and it came. I knew I had to forgive. I had to forgive this man and I did. I forgave her too. I calmly told my husband what I had learned. And the three of us worked out a solution together. What a frightened little creature she was. The baby was born in my home. Everyone thought I had given birth. And my neighbor was helping me. Actually, it was the other way around. But the widow was spared the humiliation. She had three other children. And the little boy was raised as my own. He never, he never knew the truth. I have never mentioned this incident to my husband. It has been a close chapter in our lives for 50 years. But I have read the love and gratitude in his eyes a thousand times. While our sermon this morning is not centered on family life issues, I'm too young for that. I'm very much interested in the issue of faithfulness. I am not a linguist, but I'm just a numbers tester. So I went to the experts to ask them to try to find out what does the word faithful or faithfulness mean? Miriam Webster has several definitions of the word faithful. She defines faithful in this way. And for each definition, she gives an example. The first definition, steadfast in affection or allegiance. Loyal, for example, a faithful friend. So I want you to catch that. Steadfast in affection or allegiance. To be loyal and, for example, a faithful friend. The second definition, firm in adherence to promises 
or in observance of duty. Conscientious, for example, a faithful employee. The third definition, given in the strong assurance, something that is binding, for example, a faithful promise. Fourth definition, true to the facts, to a standard, to an original, that is a faithful copy. So I want you to remember those definitions because they'll become important as we go through the sermon. So we are all in relationships, am I right? I'm not talking about marital relationships only. Every day we interact in relationships. We have relationships with our bosses at work. We have relationships with our daughters, our sons. Relationships with those who work for us and with us. We, are, we encounter relationships on a daily basis. So if I were to ask you, to mention the number one most important attributes that needs to be present for a relationship to work. What would you say? There will be different uh, responses. She says love. I heard that. She says love. Yeah? So for her, number one, love. Okay? Affection. Loyalty. Kindness. Faithfulness, those are all attributes that are important for a relationship to work. And all these responses are correct because as individuals, we are wired differently and we have different love languages, which is simply the way we prefer to be loved. For, for, so for some, kindness is number one. If you are kind to me, you and I will get along. If you are affectionate, you and I will get along. But today, I would want to talk about faithfulness as one of the pillars in a relationship. What does it really mean to be faithful? We would want to look at examples of faithfulness in Holy Scriptures. And now we'll see how that translates in our daily life. Let's turn to our Bibles. First Samuel, I'll read a few texts and then we'll get to the uh, sermon. So first Samuel 18, verse 1 to 4, it says, Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan took off the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, even his sword and his bow and his belt. Let's turn to 1 Samuel 19, just a page later. 19, verse 1 to 2, and it says, Now Saul spoke to Jonathan his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted greatly in David. So Jonathan told David, saying, My father Saul seeks to kill you. Therefore, please be on your guard until morning, and stay in a secret place and hide. A page later, 1 Samuel 20, verse 1 to 3, it says, Then David fled from Nioth, in Ramah, and went and said to Jonathan, What have I done? What is my iniquity, and what is my sin before my father, that, that before your father, that he seeks my life? So Jonathan said to him, By no means you shall not die. Indeed, my father will do nothing, either great or small, without telling me first. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. Then David took an oath again and said, Your father certainly knows that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and them. So in a nutshell, this is the story of the friendship between David and Jonathan. Jonathan was the son of a king, heir to the throne. He knew that 
at the point of death of Saul, he was going to become king. But after knowing that, he also knew that God had denied Saul to be king. And because of the knowledge that he had, he knew that David was now the rightful person to be king. And the Bible says the soul of David and Jonathan were knit together. And we see that all throughout. Jonathan is trying all he could to save the life of David. Just imagine. You know that you are supposed to be king. That post was yours. Eh? That post, you are the one to be promoted. But for some reason, they have brought somebody to be promoted instead of you. What do we do? Do we help them? Come on, church. Let's be honest. Humanity sinks in, sinks in and we say, no, I cannot help. You are here. You will know how this happens. And I'm not going to help you. But that is not the thinking that Jonathan had. Jonathan accepted and he knew that it was his role to preserve the life of the future king. And not once, not twice, but so many times he went to his father and pleaded for the life of David. And we see that all this time he is not looking at his own selfish desires, no. But Jonathan is a faithful friend. Are we faithful friends? There was a story of that was told in the morning, if you were here during the, um, uh, the Sabbath school. Janita read a poem, and in that poem there was, there was a story of a woman who confided to a deaconess of her since she was struggling with. What happened? Were we not here, church? What happened? The story was all over, yeah? She did not keep that in confidence. This is what happens to us most of the times as Christians. And it's very sad. We are not faithful to our companions. It's very difficult to find somebody who is faithful. I saw a poster somewhere. It says, you can't trust anyone. Everybody is evil. Trust no one. He's saying that. Trust no one. Everyone is evil. Because that's the, that's the life we're living in now. You do not know that the one you think is your friend and you are confiding in will be the very same person to go and tell someone who will tell someone else and your story will be all over. And you'll be asking, but I thought she was my friend. I thought I was talking to a companion I thought I was talking to someone who would keep things in confidence and help me in prayer. But that's not what we do, Christians. We do the opposite. We are not like Jonathan. Because Jonathan forgot his entitlement. He forgot himself and was faithful to the point of preserving the life of the person who was taking his position as the rightful heir to the throne. And so, Jonathan indeed loved David. It is evident in his actions. And in his instance, the proof in the faithfulness that he showed toward him. He loved, his love was proved by actions. Faithfulness is the bedrock of love. Without faithfulness, they cannot be loved. Do you agree, church? Without faithfulness, they cannot be loved. Because faithfulness is love in action. How many of our friendships can stand at par with the friendship of David and John? Yeah? How many? People we call friends are the first to betray our trust and confidence. They sell us out. It's difficult to find people you trust. If you have a Jonathan in your life, kneel down and thank God for it. If you have a David in your life, someone you know is a faithful friend, kneel down and thank God. Because in this life we're living, friends are not faithful. They betray your trust 
at the very first instance they get. So if you love someone, you'll be faithful with them. So it, it goes beyond just good service. It's not just about saying, I love you. No. Faithfulness is love in action. When you go to the second definition, we talked about a faithful employee. Firm in adherence of promises or in observance of duty. A faithful employee. A perfect example is Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 to 30. Matthew 25, verse 14 to 30, it says, I'll read the first two verses. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. And immediately he went on a journey. So, you know the passage? There are three employees. The master says, come. He gives them the talent. He leaves. The employees don't know when the master will come. Are the talents theirs or not? They are not theirs, right? What is their duty? To take care of them. And the two of them, with the love they had for their master, and they got, they got busy trying to find means and ways by which they could maximize their shareholders' wealth. Maybe I'm speaking now as a numbers person. But that's what they're doing. Their master said, this I'm entrusting to you, please take care of them. And they're taking that wealth to maximize it so that as their master is coming, they should present it to their master and say, here, you gave me five, I have ten. And they're giving it back to their master. They're not keeping one for themselves, are they? No, they are returning it to their master. In this story, do we hear anything about a salary? That's no, because you're taking care of this way, you have as a commission 10%. Do we hear anything of that? No, there is no reward, material reward, there is no commission. Their duty is to work because of the love they have before their master. But the other guy was like, oh, why should I bother? There's nothing in this for me. I stand to gain nothing. Because when this last master comes, he will just require me to give it all back to him. So he wants me to slip away for what? Why? Why should I work when there's no reward for it? There's nothing in it for me. Forget, I'm not going to do it. And he did it. So our love for the master is shown in circumstances when there is nothing in it for us. Many of the Christians today, we want to work where there's a what? Where there's a reward. When there's no reward, what happens? Nobody will show up. Church, we have a project. There's need for us to come and help molding bricks. What happens? Nobody has a meeting. Nobody is this happening. Do we come? Honestly, church. There's no reward. Why should I come? There's no reward. I'm not going. That's the time I can be in my business, trying to make things work, trying to earn money. So you want me to spend the whole day at church? Ah, no, I'm not going. I will not do it. I will not do it. Why? Because we feel there's nothing in it for us. And you go ahead and say, but I know I have to survive. Eh? I have to put food on the table. So you want me to leave my and go away. <coughs> That's what we say. And we justify ourselves. But no love for the master. No love for the master. Our project here, we are grateful to God for what he has done. Now, quote me very clearly. Grateful to God for the progress so far. But let us search our hearts as individuals. Search our hearts and be honest. How many of 
us have really sacrificed for the master. Have really sat down. There's always talk about one offering then. But how many church members? Do we really sit down and do a one offering plan? Or how many of us do we really sit down and say, you know what? I will set aside this amount of money for the project. No, we don't want to feel it. When the plate is going, we throw in a hundred quarter, that's fine. It's fine. It's okay. And yet the work of the Lord stores. Why? No love for the master. No love for the master. Because if we were we had love for our master, we would spend sleepless nights. The way we spend sleepless nights to make sure that there's food on the table, to make sure that our schools, our kids are going to good schools, we will do the same to ensure the work of the Lord is going forward. We will do that. But the reason why we do not is because there is no reward. <coughs> We feel like we are throwing money in a bottomless pit. I'm not getting anything out of it. Why should I bother? I'll just be keep throwing the hundred quarters in there. It's, a, it's okay. It's okay. I'm giving. I'm giving. What more do you want from me? So, let's search our hearts. Let us search our hearts and know that God is requiring of us a faithful service. So, back to the issue of what we're talking about. Faithfulness and love, they are mutually exclusive. They are not mutually exclusive. <coughs> Faithfulness and love are not mutually exclusive. What does that mean? What are mutually exclusive events? Things that what? What are mutually exclusive? Things that, that can happen together, right? One must happen separate from the other. But what we're saying is, faithfulness and love are not that. Faithfulness and love must happen together. There is a saying among the male gender. Men, I'm coming to you. When they are unfaithful to their wives, what do they say? But I still love you. If he cheated, you say, she did not mean anything to me. You are the one I love. Is that true? That's not true. You are faithful to the one you love. Because faithfulness <coughs> is the bedrock of love. If he raised his hand to the wife, what would he say? I did not mean it. I don't know what came off of me. I still love you and my actions have nothing to do with it. Is that true? If you love your wife, you will not raise your hand to her. The fact that we try and convince ourselves to say, I still love you, is because something is wrong. Something's wrong. Love has been broken. And because love has been broken, there's no faithfulness. You have not been faithful to the vows you've made and have broken them. Where there's faithfulness, where there's no faithfulness, there can be no love. Because faithfulness is the better of love. To my female gender, lest you think the same one that will apply to you. Exodus 1, verse 15, 16. The two Egyptian Levites, they were told by the king, <coughs> look here, these Hebrews have increased in great number and they are going to overthrow us. So for us to control them, if it's male, kill. Isn't it? Female can live. Simple instructions. Did the two midwives obey the king's command? No, they did not. They did not. But the midwives feared God, Exodus 1 verse 17, and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded, but sent the male children. As women, we have the duty before God. We have a duty. And sometimes it's worrying 
to see and think what kind of a generation are we raising? What kind of future men and women are we raising? Why? Because as women, sometimes we sleep on the job. We sleep on the job. Ellen White in Adventist form says, page 87, it is the right of every daughter of Eve to have a thorough knowledge of household duties, to receive training in every department of domestic labor. Every young lady should be so educated that if, if called to fill the position of wife and mother, she may preside as a queen in her domain. She should be fully competent to guide and instruct her children and to direct her servants, if need be, to minister with her own hands to the wants of her household. When you read the passage, as a mother, you are a teacher, a cook, a seamstress, a PE teacher, there's exercise and having fun in bed. You are a doctor, nurse, first aider, all those things. That's who you are as a woman. When you go to, uh, to the hospital, yeah, I want you to take note. Maybe you're not part of the, what is happening, but if you find yourself where there's a woman and a man, they are a couple, they have taken a sick child to the hospital. I want you to notice something and I'll ask you a question. If you have ever noticed it, where the doctor is now addressing, he wants to ask, what has happened? So tell me, uh, what, are, what has the child been doing? Whom will he face for answers? The man, yeah? He will spend away attention to the man. Why? Why not the father? Because as the mother, you are the first doctor <coughs> or nurse for the child. So the duty that women have is greater. So I'm so much interested in the issue of developing minds. Because as we read the same Adventist form, it says we should keep in touch with the developing minds of the children. Sometimes you, you just just take time and listen. If you have a little one at home, they are going and bubbling, bubbling, talking all the time. And listen. That's when you realize that probably I am sleeping on my job. Because that is the only time you know how the mind is developing. So if we do not take time, we are too busy. Women, we, we have so many things to do. We find things to do. Our time is not without things to do. But what we are being counseled is that we should pay attention to the developing minds. We should look for developing evil habits in our kids and prune them out. Most of the time women will say they're just kids. They will grow these uh, habits. Isn't that what we say? Am I talking to myself? We say they will grow these habits. But we should know that you are raising a future church board member. Yeah? You are raising a future wife, a future husband. Some of the problems you face in the church, yeah, when you go to church board meetings, I'm not saying this about the women. When you go to church board meetings, you find difficult characters in there. And you know that this is not a today problem. This goes back to how this person was raised. We are raising husbands and wives. Some of the marital problems that are there now is because the mother somewhere slept on the job. She slept, didn't prune the evil habits, and those habits became characters. And now there are problems that are very difficult to be solved. I remember when I was young. You think I'm young now, but I was young. <laughs> we knew that after church, you look for where your mother or father are, and automatically, what happens? You go sit next to them. No negotiation. No negotiations. 
of the children that we are raising, we let them wonder. We don't know what they mean. They sit in that room. I think Uncle Hester already talked about this. They sit in that room. You don't know what they're doing there. Eh? You don't know what kind of conversations they're having. They're not getting anything from the sermon. But we let them wonder. Even the young ones, we let them run around. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that is what we said? They will grow these things. This is why we are losing young people in the church. This is why the older ones are remaining and the young ones. Because they get the same age and the same age and they go like, that's not my church, that's my parents' church. Why? We slept on the job. We slept on the job. We did not take our duty to make sure that if I'm in church listening to the sermon, where is my son? Where is my daughter? What are they doing wherever they are? I need to know. If I don't know, problem. So if as women we remain faithful to our duty as a wife and a mother, then that is the evidence that we indeed our love our husbands and children for faithfulness is the bedrock of love. So we're coming to the end. So we may ask, so what, what's the, what to what end am I to be faithful? I mean, are you serious? I should be faithful all the time? I'm sure there are certain instances that even God himself understands that. No, my daughter, you've tried me here. It's okay. We, we, we talk to ourselves like that. But when we, when we read Revelation 2 verse 10, it says, I'll read 2 verse 10b, it says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. Faithfulness is unto what? Yes. So the standard of heaven is high. They are, there is no halfway. You can't, have, you can't do it halfway. That's to be, you have to be all the way there. It's all or nothing. So, we are called to this standard to be faithful unto death. If we are faced in a scenario where we have to make a choice, and where the choosing faithfulness will lead us to a loss of a job, we are to choose faithfulness. If faithfulness will lead us to a loss of a friend, then we choose faithfulness. If it will lead us to a loss of possessions, we choose faithfulness. Because the standard of heaven is what? That's what the standard of heaven is. is. The Bible says, be faithful unto death. Referring back to the story we read at the beginning, there will be times in our life we will find ourselves on the receiving end of unfaithfulness. It's not our problem. We've been faithful. But maybe somebody has been unfaithful to what is the answer? The answer is forgiveness. Just as God forgives us when we are unfaithful to him, we also need to forgive those who are unfaithful to us. Some of us are missing wounds of bosses who were evil to us. We were the moral employee, but we were rewarded with false accusations and unfair dismissals followed. God is calling us to let go of that animosity and forgive. Some of us are nursing wounds of church members who were unfaithful to, to us, to the trust we put in them. They probably disclosed something to someone else which we told them in confidence. And we have never forgiven them. God is calling us to forgive this afternoon. Some of us have such animosity in our hearts that after years in marriage, we still angry because of the unfaithfulness of our spouse in whatever form. But God is calling us to forgive. May the love of God and the fellowship of His Spirit be with us all as we choose to remain faithful until Jesus comes. Amen. Right, mm -hmm.
would like to thank the Lord for the message that he has brought unto us. May he help us to be faithful always. In closing, we are going to sing hymn number 512. May the congregation stand as we sing. We will only sing the first stanza.